Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the Executive Director, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this very special event. Uh, before I begin, if I can please ask everyone to take your iPhones or Samsungs and whatever and turn them on, on silent because we are broadcasting live on C-SPAN 1. So please watch your language, uh, speak in uh, clear tones so people around the world can hear us today. Um, you are free to, uh, to tweet as much as you like uh, because we are eager to get the message of today's discussion out far and wide. Uh, uh, it is not often that uh, one can time the publication of a new book um, so propitiously to an international event, or perhaps I should say it's not often that one can arrange an international referendum in a faraway country to be timed perfectly with the publication of a new book. But as it turns out, um, we have today this confluence of events. We have the referendum in Turkey that, um, uh, although it, uh, the results and the process were uh, uh, provocative and remain controversial and subject to great debate, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. Um, the result seems to be to elevate um, the existing president of, uh, of Turkey into an even higher, more elevated position, um, uh, uh, one that one might be able to call the new sultan. Um, surprisingly enough, that is the title of this new book, by the director of the Washington Institute's Turkish research program, Soner Chabtai, the new sultan, Erdogan and the crisis of modern Turkey. Um, so right away we know that Turkey is a country in crisis, um, as the title, the subtitle of Soner's um, outstanding new work suggests. And the subject of today's discussion is what type of crisis? How lasting a crisis? A crisis at home, a crisis abroad, a crisis getting worse or a crisis getting better now for all the provocation and controversy that there may even be some clarity about the direction of Turkish leadership. And to talk about these questions, um, first I'm going to be quite delighted to welcome to the podium the author of The New Sultan, uh, my colleague, the Bayer Family Fellow here at the Institute, uh, Sonur Chabtai. And then uh, we have an outstanding array of Turkish expertise um, uh, here on the panel, and as I look around the audience, um, uh, um, a remarkable um, array of Turkish expertise uh, within these four walls. But after I turn to Soner, um, I'm delighted to welcome to the podium Gunul Tul, who is the founding director of the Middle East Center for Turkey, of the Middle East Institute's Center for Turkish Studies and an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies here in uh, Washington. And then we'll turn to Amber and Zaman, who is a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Middle East program, uh, uh, veteran journalist writing for El Monitor, um, uh, 15 years the Turkish correspondent for The Economist. Um, really delighted to have uh, this panel, um, which brings such in-depth knowledge of the current political situation and the likely direction of, uh, of politics of Turkey and special interest to this audience, of course, the direction of the U.S.-Turkish relationship in this new era. We've already seen the, the first sign of the direction of the U.S.-Turkish relationship, of course, with President Trump's outreach to um, uh, the newly re-empowered um, President Erdogan uh, just yesterday. Um, uh, uh, I'm now going to call to the podium my colleague Soner. Um, Soner has been with the Institute now for many years. He's the author of, um, uh, 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 of several books on Turkish domestic and foreign policy. Um, uh, I think one of Soner's greatest uh, claims to fame is that there is a direction, that there is a generation of American foreign service officers. Um, uh, who have gone on to, um, to serve America abroad in Turkey, who have passed through uh, Soner's tender mercies as an instructor of, uh, of American diplomats abroad. And I think that we are all better served for that. 
that, um, um, that America's representatives in Turkey have had the benefit of Soder's insight and wisdom. And that's really one of the things we try to do here at the Institute, is uh, not just opine in books, op-eds, and television, but to do what we can to improve the quality of American foreign policy by such things as, as teaching American diplomats. And so I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to have Soner. Soner, the podium is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I'm so pleased to see uh, so many of my friends and colleagues from around town. Uh, it's a great day for me. I really appreciate that you're all here. I also wanted to thank uh, Amerin and Gunil for joining me at this panel. Uh, they're two uh, of the top-notch experts in town on uh, Turkish politics. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, Gunil had an uh, excellent op-ed in the New York Times this morning on Turkey after the referendum. Uh, I loved reading it. Amerin is a frequent commentator on uh, various issues, and I'm a I've been a follower of her work uh, for nearly two decades, so I'm very pleased that uh, both are with me at this panel today. Uh, I, I also wanted to start, of course, by uh, thanking uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan he is for well-timing uh, the referendum to overlap with the launch of my book, um, and I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, this is <laughs> literally and figuratively. Uh, this is obviously a critical time in Turkish history. Uh, I, I just want to tell you about the first little bit of my, my book, The New Sultan. I decided to write this book last year in June, um, and the whole original idea was that I would write it over a year. It would be edited sometime this spring and published in the next uh, summer. Uh, then the coup happened. As I was writing the book, my ed editors, editors reached out to me and they asked me to pull up the deadline. I agreed, so I wrote it uh, between uh, coming back from the beach in August and, and Christmas in December, about four months. Uh, and then it was edited and copy edited and proofread and designed and uh, typeset and printed in the last three months, and there you go, in my hands, the new sultan. Uh, I'm very proud of the book, of course, but I really want to uh, thank, uh, once again, a number of people who, uh, to whom I owe gratitude for getting this work together. Uh, of course, first of all, my boss, Rob Satloff, because he's my boss and I'm doing salary review with him right now. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Uh, the Institute and my colleagues, uh, this is a great place to work. Uh, I would say it's one of the best places to work and probably the best intellectual incubator. Uh, I've enjoyed tremendously my tenure here in the last 15 years. I uh, feel lucky to be surrounded by so many smart people and my colleagues, as well as our, uh, our uh, research assistants. Uh, I have been blessed in the last uh, decade and a half by a very impressive group of interns and <coughs> research assistants. Some of them are in this room. I see uh, Merve, uh, Jim is here. Uh, you guys are both in the book, thank you. But of course, uh, the biggest thanks goes to Oya, uh, who's sitting up in the front. Oya, would you get up for a second? Sorry to embarrass you. <laughs> yeah, I think you deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Oya was with me at every stage in the writing of this book. Uh, I hope that I did not drive her crazy. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, we went through every sentence literally together. There'll be instances where I would tell her a sentence and she would finish it. I would say, have you looked at that typo? And she would say, yes, I fixed it. So thank you, Oya. I could not have this without you. I should also mention that I have uh, dedicated this book to the loving memory of my mother. I was born into a working class family in Eastern Turkey and I went to Yale for my PhD. And uh, my parents who have raised me and my siblings uh, deserve uh, indefinite gratitude. And so this goes to my mom's memory. But I want to turn to my book now, uh, why I wrote it and what it's really about. And then I'll uh, go to my colleagues and we'll have a hopefully a good discussion on that. I followed Turkish politics as a student for nearly two decades. I've written on it. In the last uh, 15 years, I've been at the Institute analyzing and writing on Turkey. So for those of you who followed my work, you'll find uh, uh, traces of our discussions in this book. And in many ways, uh, the New Sultan follows my previous book, as Rob has mentioned, uh, The Rise of Turkey. Uh, this, in this book, I looked at Turkey's economic growth under President Erdogan, uh, currently Prime Minister previously, and his Justice and Development Party. And I argue that uh, after having uh, Turkey had witnessed tremendous economic growth in the last decade, that after having been transformed economically, Erdogan's task was not to, to transform Turkey politically. To this end, I said, uh, and I believe this, that I, I think Erdogan wants to make Turkey a great power, and I said uh, the path to that goes through becoming an advanced economy, and that Erdogan has made Turkey a country uh, which makes and sells cars, but to become an advanced economy, Turkey has to become a hub for Google, and the path to that goes through becoming an open society and the liberal democracy. So I argued in my book, The Rise of Turkey, that the homework was therefore 
to get to, to that uh, advanced society, economy and open society, to build a, a new liberal democratic order, one that would provide for freedoms for the two halves of Turkey, which I'm going to discuss in a minute, that is freedom of religion for the religious half and freedom from religion for the secular half, roughly defined, and that this new constitution would have to provide for broad liberties for all citizens, including the Kurds. I concluded that relieved of its uh, perennial uh, secular religious tensions and the burden of the Kurdish problem inside and outside of the country, Turkey would then soar, become an uh, 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 avoid the trap of a middle income economy, and become a great power. I don't think Erdogan read my book. <laughs> so I wrote this one now, uh, The Crisis of Turkey. So let me now tell you what the crisis is and where I think it is heading. Um, the book is really a story of Erdogan's power consolidation in Turkey since 2003 when he became prime minister. I've, I've tracked various steps of it, happy to look at it in the Q&A. And I argue in the conclusion that Erdogan has become as unassailable as was Ataturk once, meaning he is the most powerful Turk. But the problem is half of Turkey loves him and the other half of Turkey loathes him. And that is the crisis in which Turkey has found itself as a result of Erdogan's uh, political trajectory. What is more, I argue in my book, that Erdogan now wants to shape Turkey in his own image, in a way, uh, once upon a time, Ataturk did. So I suggest that he's following what I call, in quotes, that is, Ataturk model. What is the Ataturk model? In the early 20th century, Ataturk set up Turkey as a modern state, and then he shaped it in his own image, using state power, including education policy, as a secular Western uh, European society. And Erdogan wants to use the Ataturk model, but of course, uh, I think he's taking a cue from Ataturk, the country's founder, but he wants to both emulate and replace Ataturk. Of course, he does not share Ataturk's values, just methods. Uh, that is top-down social engineering, and he wants to use state power once again, including the educational policy, to shape Turkey in his own image, very different than Ataturk's Turkey, a country that would therefore become, as in Erdogan's vision, uh, to the core uh, Islamic, politically that is, religious and Middle Eastern and conservative. And that's a top-down kind of Jacobin methods that I think that uh, Erdogan is, is borrowing from Ataturk, the Ataturk model. But Erdogan has a problem. Ataturk was a military general. Erdogan uh, has a democratic mandate, or I should say he had one until this Sunday. There is widespread consensus that uh, election process was not fair. And there is emerging consensus that there were irregularities during the, uh, the day of the voting. We don't know the scale of the irregularities, but that's the, where the problem is because Erdogan has suggested to move forward. He has declared himself executive style president. He said that's over. We're not going back to the election. So he has at best a mandate in question for half of the country that doesn't support him. And that only exacerbates Turkey's deep societal polarization. In my view, the vote does not alleviate it, it actually exacerbates the, the, the divide. And Turkey is split in the middle, therefore, between pro and anti-Erdogan camps. I also argue in the book that it's unlikely that Erdogan will be able to impose his vision that I highlighted on the entire Turkish society. Turkey is, as you know, there are, there are many experts on Turkey in this room. I see um, uh, some of my friends and uh, former students from the State Department. We've discussed this many times. This is a very complicated country of uh, a melange of uh, political, ethnic, uh, religious, and social groups. And Erdogan's uh, difficult that it's going to impose his vision on the entire country, entire society. We saw this in Sunday's referendum. A near majority, if not a majority of Turks, voted against it. Uh, and what's more importantly, uh, I think we have a map of Turkey. If we can put it on there for a second. There you go. If you can see on the map from Anatolian agency, uh, an overwhelming uh, number of Turkish provinces along the coast and northwest representing an overwhelming percentage of Turkey's GDP voted against him. He lost Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir, all three large cities. Istanbul is his home city. He lost that. Istanbul is where he started his political career, which I track in my book, in 1994 when he became its mayor. That was his stage. That's where he provided good governance, cleaned up the city. It is why the Turks decided to give him the benefit of doubt and make him prime minister later on and help his AKP rise to power. Uh, so he's lost that. He's lost, obviously, support of him, uh, some of the key cities of the country, but more importantly, um, uh, as well as losing in the Kurdish areas. He's lost Istanbul. 
including his own neighborhood in Istanbul. So those are very significant developments. To me, it suggests that it's going to be impossible for him to impose his vision on the entire society going forward. I argue in my book that Turkey is simply too large demographically, too big economically, and too complicated politically for one person to control it in its entirety. Uh, despite Erdogan's efforts to create a crony class of capitalists, for instance, uh, Tusiat, Turkey's Fortune 500, which controls a large part of Turkey's economic wealth, is still uh, wedded to liberal, democratic, secular, and European values. So it's going to be really hard for him to move forward. Let me now look at uh, tra uh, trajectories, uh, which I highlight in my book, going forward. I see uh, three trajectories from here, moving forward. And I'm going to uh, conclude a little bit looking at uh, post-referendum foreign policy environment, which I think deserves some uh, def uh, discussion as well. The first trajectory is the current state of affairs, state of crisis deeply polarized society in which half of the country, uh, that is the pro-Erdogan wing of Turkey, conservative, Islamist, nationalist, three uh, groups uh, uh, who believe that Turkey is heaven, and the other half, a loose coalition of op opposition figures, uh, socialists, leftists, social democrats, Kurds, uh, Alevis, who are liberal Muslims, who believe that Turkey is uh, hell. And this is the best case of, uh, I, in my view, unfortunately, going forward, this permanent state of crisis that Turkey's stuck under. So long as Turkey is genuinely democratic, Erdogan cannot continue to govern the way that he wants. And there's a chance that he might become even more autocratic going forward. There's a chance that he might even end democracy in Turkey going forward. That is the second trajectory. The third is an extension of the second, uh, societal polarization coupled with attacks from the right by far right by ISIS, from the far left by PKK, uh, together with nefarious neighbors that surround Turkey, all of whom want Erdogan's fall from Russia to Assad regime to Iran, could, I argue in my book, could even catapult Turkey into unfortunate and unwanted civil conflict. Uh, that's a scenario I will have to be able to hash, hash out for you in the q of course. But I really want to turn now and look at Erdogan's uh, foreign policy challenges, because we haven't discussed that yet. And I spent a lot of time in the book about how uh, Russia, of course, is the nemesis that keeps coming, despite the fact that the Russians are friendly towards Erdogan. They're making up, uh, they're also deploying uh, troops and setting up a base in Afrin. Afrin is an a enclave controlled by YPG, which is allied with the PKK, which Erdogan is fighting. Um, U.S. policy also works with YPG, but only where there is ISIS. Russia is in Afrin where there is no ISIS. Afrin is surrounded by Assad regime, Turkey-backed rebels, and Turkey. Guess who... Russia is there to hurt. It's obviously not the Assad regime. It's Turkey and its allies. So going forward, I think Russia is going to be Erdogan's uh, nemesis as well as, uh, as, well as uh, most feared enemy. But does this mean Erdogan is coming to the bosom of the Western world? He's not. And we kind of saw this in the run-up to the election. Uh, both uh, the West and the European Union became a punching bag uh, in the run-up to the referendum. And I think this is going to continue. That has a lot to do with Erdogan's next step. Yes, he has become executive-style president, but he also wants to, obviously, there are elections coming up. Uh, he has to win those elections. That's for the parliament, his party. Uh, something interesting happened in the last election, if we can, uh, the map is still there. So um, some of the voters of the Nationalist Action Party, which is a smaller faction in the Turkish parliament that polls just about 10%, uh, voted for Erdogan in the referendum, and some of them voted against him in the referendum. This is an important party. It's one of the four parties in the parliament. It's splitting. The split hap is happening where voters in uh, central and northeastern Anatolia uh, with MHP are flipping for Erdogan. And MHP voters in the coastal provinces and large cities are flipping against Erdogan. Uh, that is music to Erdogan's ears because it means that he can uh, solidify AKP's popularity with voters flocking to his party from MHP. This is an ultra-nationalist uh, party. It also suggests that MHP's support to Erdogan not only strengthens AKP, but in case of new elections, SNAP or on-time parliamentary elections, MHP will fail Turkey's high 10% electoral threshold. When that happens, AKP has supermajority in the parliament, with as little as 45, perhaps even under that kind of uh, percentage of vote. I think that's Erdogan's goal going forward. So that means uh, ultra-nationalists on foreign po policy issues uh, on the European Union, I anticipate uh, major problems in ties with Europe. Uh, he has just suggested he might want to bring back capital punishment. That would end up with Turkey being kicked out of Council of Europe. If Turkey is kicked out of Council of Europe, 
Turkish courts will not be recognizing European Court of Human Rights as the highest court of the country. Turkish citizens will not have access to that, and I think that changes the political dynamics in the country because he controls the courts. Um, I also anticipate a hard nationalist foreign policy line uh, towards U.S. cooperation with YPG because that is in line with his uh, hardline policy on the Kurds in general to uh, flirt, to uh, make sure that MHP voters that have flipped for him in the referendum become permanent AKP voters. So I think that's his game uh, going forward. I have provided you with so much doom and gloom. Uh, I want to bring some good news before I end. So there's a fourth trajectory for Turkey. I've given you three in my book. I don't want to tell you all about it because I want you to buy it. Um, <laughs> then the fourth trajectory excludes Erdogan. Uh, this is, it's because of him, but despite him scenario. So he's made Turkey wealthy. Uh, thanks to him, this is a middle class society. That's where he deserves credit. Turkey has grown. Uh, it has better infrastructure. Its citizens live better off than they did before. Uh, the fact of it from my previous book that I liked most, Rise of Turkey, is that when Erdogan came to power, infant mortality rate in Turkey was comparable to pre-war Syria, and now it is comparable to Spain. <coughs> Turks used to live like Syrians, now they live like the Spanish, that's why they're voting for Erdogan. That's primarily it. But I also argue that this growth has built a middle class base, and now they're making some very middle class demands. And it is the wealthier provinces along the, the Mediterranean, the Aegean, and the Marmara Sea that have voted against him in the referendum. Uh, so that's a good sign going forward. But I don't want to get carried away with the case for a liberal Turkey because, number one, the opposition uh, th that's against Erdogan, of course, is an extremely divided one. It's as large as the pro-Erdogan camp, but very divided. It includes Turkish and Kurdish nationalists, seculars and conservatives, uh, center-right and center-left. Sometimes the gap between them is, the wider, is wider than the gap between them and Erdogan. I think that's a challenge. But there's a bigger challenge. To go back to uh, uh, the leadership issue, uh, the opposition lacks a charismatic leader. Uh, conservative Islamist Turks have their own Ataturk, in quotes, that is Erdogan. But the real Ataturk, of course, is dead. And that is the challenge for the other half of Turkey that wants to oppose Erdogan. And I think until that, at the day that such a man or woman emerges, who can make a case for a liberal Turkey, a liberal Turkey that would have a constitution that would provide freedom of religion and freedom from religion simultaneously, that would provide broad liberties for all, individual liberties, including cultural liberties for all, as including the Kurds. Until that moment comes, I remain deeply worried about uh, Turkey's future. But I do uh, think that while liberal Turkey remains a distant dream, it is plausible given the economic transformation that Turkey has uh, gone under Erdogan. So it's Perhaps thanks to him that I'm going to write my next book as well. So uh, watch this space. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, of course, Sonar, congratulations. Uh, I think he's one of the most productive Turkey experts in town. He makes us look lazy. Uh, and my boss um, loves you. <laughs> Aside from that, I really enjoyed <laughs> reading, you your, that, reading, <laughs> reading your book. Um, but of course, when I picked up the book, um, the first thing came to my mind was, which sultan? <laughs> So I think at this point, uh, after Sandy's referendum, many of us can live with um, Suleiman the Magnificent, who was a reformer. But what about <laughs> uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, who was a truly authoritarian ruler? Um, I think the book does a great job of opening um, a window into Erdogan's psyche. And through telling his personal narrative, and this is a narrative of victimhood, which resonates very well among his constituency and actually beyond. Um, it's showing us the interplay, the interaction between the founding ideology, Kemalism, and the reactions to it. So that's why I particularly enjoyed reading the chapters on Kurdish nationalism and Islamism, both reactions to, to the Kemalist ideology. Um, but I think Turkey right now lives in a post-Kemalist and post-Islamist era. Um, and one would expect this era to, to embrace 
liberal values because both Kemalism and, and Islamism, they are both um, radical authoritarian ideologies. So this post-Kemalist and post-Islamist era is not really embracing uh, liberalism, liberal values, and the opposite is actually happening. As Omar, uh, as Sonar mentions um, in the book, uh, there is now a growing middle class in Turkey, uh, and they are demanding middle class values. Um, so this is striking because at a time when there is a growing middle class in Turkey, they are not really demanding middle class values. Um, Instead, there is a growing authoritarianism. And I think there is, it's because there is something inherently authoritarian in Turkish political culture. Uh, and some might blame me for being an essentialist, but, but I believe that that is really, um, that, is, that lies at the heart of, of, of the issue here. And I think the original sin of Turkey's political culture is um, the loss of the, the statist ideology. I mean, the state occupies a very unique place in the Turkish psyche. Uh, the development, uh, rebuilding the society, everything has been done uh, through state. Uh, and even uh, the bourgeois was created by the state itself. Uh, and that's why we have a middle class, that's why we have a business class that's not really standing up uh, against Erdogan's authoritarian policies in the 21st century. Instead, many are aligning with, with, uh, with the government. So that loss of bourgeoisie, I think, starting from, from the, the late 19th century uh, and the rebuilding of the bourgeoisie by the state itself, um, I think that was problematic. And, 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 and again, I think that explains um, the state of Turkish democracy at the moment and, and the people who are uh, supporting Erdogan. Because I think on Sunday, going back to the Islamism versus uh, Kemalism or secularism debate, I think the people who voted on Sunday uh, in favor of the referendum, the 50%, they were not voting for, for Islamism. And those who were opposed to it, uh, they were not uh, obviously entirely Kemalist either. Uh, so there's something else going on here, uh, and, and, and the 50% the that voted yes on Sunday, they just do not mind authoritarianism. Um, at, of course, this is, this is a very dark picture, so where do we go from here? And I'm uh, a bit optimistic about Sunday's um, results, because I think um, the slim, the razor-thin majority that he captured on Sunday gives me hope. And at the end, electoral politics will, will play a role. Um, but I think more than that, of course, w we don't know um, what his Erdogan strategy will be moving forward. But I believe, um, despite his victory, he has lost ground. He has lost ground within his own constituency. He lost all major cities, including Istanbul, which is a very important place. He launched his political career in Istanbul, and he hasn't lost since mid-1990s. So the fact that he lost Istanbul is very telling. Um, and, and some of his base, especially the, the educated urban uh, base, uh, I don't think they are 100% happy with his uh, authoritarian tendencies. Um, and also, he, in the run-up to the referendum, he, um, he played to the nationalists. He, his main strategy was galvanizing the nationalist vote. So he employed this very uh, ultra-nationalistic rhetoric. And yet, I think that strategy didn't pay off. He could not be able to mobilize the nationalist base as much as he wanted to. Uh, and instead, he increased his votes in, in, in the Kurdish region compared to the November elections, uh, which is surprising. He increased, uh, of course, it's, uh, right now uh, it's, it's very fluid. It's very difficult to be sure about the numbers. But what we're hearing from, especially from local journalists, is that hundreds of thousands of people uh, 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 the, the ruling party, the AKP, increased its votes by uh, around 400,000, which is almost 1%. Um, 
and and he I th I think Erdogan took a note of that. And in his victory speech, uh, sorry, the one before that on the day of, of, of the referendum, uh, he said that we increased our votes in, in, in the Kurdish region. So if he really wants to return the favor, that I think that is good news. So instead of aligning with the nationalists, this time he might have to recalibrate, re recalibrate his strategy and uh, maybe work with the Kurds. And that could mean, and I know my, my friend and my colleague here, Amberin, uh, disagrees with me, but uh, he might go back to the negotiations, resume the peace talks with the Kurds. Uh, of course, if he chooses to um, play to the, instead of aligning with the nationalists, uh, working with, with the Kurds. So that is good news. That would be good news, not only domestically, also uh, the Turkish economy has been hit hard by, by, by terrorist attacks. So that would be good news for, for economy as well, because I think the economic downturn is going to impact um, uh, his popularity as well. Uh, so, so and, and also that would make some room to maneuver uh, for Ankara in Syria, and th that, that would also remove some of the tension um, from uh, Turkey-US relations um, as well. Um, so I'm, I would like to be optimistic, uh, but, but on the other hand, uh, I think this is, knowing that he's a pragmatic leader um, gives me hope. But yesterday, uh, I was sp there was a panel at the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center, and one of my colleagues uh, mentioned that He's always been a pragmatic. We've all, always known him as a pragmatic leader. But he's been in power for so long uh, that, that he's become the state himself. Uh, and that was the point that I was trying to make, that statist ideology uh, captured him now. So now he's not that pragmatic leader that, that uh, we always thought he was. And instead, he's going to be more ideological. So he's going to have those ideological reflexes, which might prevent him working with, with uh, the Kurdish nationalists. So um, it's difficult to make predictions uh, when it comes to Turkey. Might be a little bit easier now that <laughs> we have a, officially we have a presidential system and a textbook authoritarian country. Uh, but still, when it comes to Erdogan, um, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to say what his next move is going to be, but that 1%, uh, that thin margin, um, gives me hope, and I would like to end it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm too short for that podium. Trust me, you're not. <laughs> okay, if you say so. Thank you very much for hosting me here, and I'd like to return the compliment. So now I've been following you for around 20 years, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> she was 10 years old. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. And so here's what I'd like to say about your book. If I were a journalist and my editor told me to go and cover that referendum, and I never set foot in Turkey before, didn't know what the hell was going on, this would be a godsend. I mean, this is really great, you know, it sort of brings you up to speed, it's tightly written, it hits all the, you know, main points, it's really, really a fantastic book, very timely, obviously, and raises some of the most critical issues in Turkey today, uh, and above all, the whole, you know, issue of polarization, which of course is, is uh, a huge uh, challenge for Turkish society. Being the last to speak, obviously everything that needed <laughs> to be said has pretty much been said already, but i just like to add a few of my thoughts. And in terms of yesterday's result, I think that it was, you know, in Turkish, a yes is evet, no is hayır, this was havet. <laughs> and that was probably, you know, uh, the least bad result we could have had in some respects, given that we all assumed that Erdogan would win uh, this uh, referendum. So the, the 
majority he has is, is not really much of a majority. It's razor thin, as my colleagues pointed out, which means in term that he can't really bask in the glory of this huge, you know, popular mandate that he was handed by the adoring Turkish people. On the other hand, he's saddled with all the responsibility of power because he did win, and now he has this um, baby in his lap. Uh, so where will things go from here? First of all, this doesn't kick in until November 3rd, uh, 2019, technically. So between now and then, you know, what will happen, I'm sure is weighing heavily on his mind. As my colleague said, he lost Istanbul, that's huge, which in turn suggests that his grassroots organization were not really working very hard. Uh, and I'm, I think that as soon as he gets invited to lead the party again, which is one of the provisions of this new system that kicks in immediately, as soon as the uh, results are made official, he'll set about, I think, doing a huge sort of shake-up within his own party. And in doing so, probably generating a fresh batch of disgruntleds, you know, uh, p adding to this big pile that already exists. Uh, so that's not going to, I think, work that well for him necessarily, depending on where those disgruntles are channeled, whether they can uh, assemble, coalesce around a leader. And uh, people like Meral Akshenar leap to mind of the MHP. It's too early to say yet. I think it's probably too wildly optimistic to expect all the forces aligned against him to unite, uh, because we're looking at Meral Akshenar, who goes berserk when she sees the Kurdish flag raised in Kirkuk to uh, Selatin Demirtas. Uh, so very difficult. Um, but here's the thing. For the first time since the 1980 coup, I think the legitimacy of Turkish democracy globally has not been questioned uh, in this way. I think that's a big change. It ought to worry uh, President Erdogan. Uh, there's, a, you know, the way this uh, referendum is being framed in the international press is all about uh, fraud about um, irregularities. I think the OSCE report, and I, God knows I've followed a lot of uh, OSCE uh, press conferences when I was living in Armenia, uh, and those elections were really bad, yet what they said yesterday, I was quite taken aback. I've never heard them sound this harsh before. So uh, I'm imagining that President Erdogan is feeling intensely grateful to President Trump. I'm very puzzled by why President Trump would, you know, uh, give him that, being that he knows how desperate he was for that stamp of legitimacy, and you would have thought that uh, the United States would have leveraged that. So what happens next? Because it's so thin, this majority, you know, we can't really talk about a stable situation. My colleagues described why. This in turn means that Erdogan will continue to instrumentalize foreign policy, which of course bodes ill for the US-Turkish relationship and the US-EU relationship. It also means that in order to deflect attention away from all these um, big question marks about the legitimacy of the election, of why he lost Istanbul, etc., he may embark on some uh, crazy adventures. Uh, he may decide that it's the time to attack Talabiyat uh, in northern Syria or maybe dive into Sinjar in Iraqi Kurdistan. We simply uh, don't know. But um, I think that the good news is really that, you know, uh, despite all the adversity, with all my colleagues, the most articulate uh, journalists who could have, you know, put forward the case the most uh, effectively against this referendum in jail, with Selatin Demirtas, thousands of Kurdish uh, politicians in jail. Um, the, the fact that the government hogged all the airways, despite all the adversity in short, that you know we should have this result is extraordinary and points, I think, to the strength of civil society. And I think also it shows that um, Turkish, Turkish society is maturing. In the old days, people would sit back, fold their arms and say, well, the army will come to the rescue. Well, that's not a given anymore. But, you know, it falls upon individual Turks to sort of fight the fight. And I think that's uh, very good news. 
Uh, and I think this is by no means over. Turkish democracy remains very much a work in progress. I think to some extent the Arab Spring was triggered by Turkey, by Erdogan, you know, challenging the establishment, the army, but then it sort of came full circle and now he's more like them. But then you had this result with people, you know, pushing back. I think people will continue to watch Turkey. Uh, I'm proud of my country and I'm proud of you, Sana, for this book. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, three uh, fascinating and insightful presentations, which gives us um, a lot to, to talk about now. Um, if I can uh, uh, just pick up really with, with an intriguing comment that you made um, uh, in, your, in your, your final remark, Amber, and ask you all about uh, the direction of U.S.-Turkish relations. Um, uh, uh, now that we do have this outreach from President Trump to President Erdogan, um, do you expect um, uh, 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 Turkey to be um, a deeper and more complete partner with the United States in what what uh, uh, the White House is trying to do in Syria and Iraq, um, or do you expect uh, a more maverick um, uh, approach from uh, Erdogan as we as we go ahead? I think the maverick here might be President Trump. I'm under the impression that he might not have been, <laughs> not, might not have consulted the State Department or Ambassador Bass in Ankara uh, before he decided to make that a phone call. Uh, I think that um, President Trump seems to sort of act on impulse, uh, and perhaps that that's what just happened. I don't know, uh, but the case remains that for as long as the United States' top priority is to defeat ISIS uh, in 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 Syria, particularly, uh, the tensions will remain because the premier partner of choice to do that job remains the YPG. And uh, already yesterday, we heard before the phone call, President Erdogan railing against you know countries that do uh, to to work with terrorists. So I think that will remain a point of friction. I think the whole Zarab case is something that we all need to watch. Uh, I find it very interesting that uh, former Mayor Giuliani is now in the mix, uh, lobbying, I guess, on Turkey's behalf, though he may dispute the, uh, the, the word lobbying. Um, Can you give two sentences about what this is so that everyone oh, understands? Um, the whole Zarab case it has to do with this uh, Azeri Turkish Iranian uh, gold trader who was basically busting uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran by sort of uh, you know buying gold with Iranian money and then sending selling the gold and then sending the money back. I, mean, I think roughly that's kind of how it worked to Iran and he got busted and he's uh, sitting in a, in a in a jail in in New York somewhere right and uh, most recently the deputy general manager of one of Turkey's largest state owned banks was also arrested in New York in connection with this case uh, and uh, we've uh, president Erdogan has raised this case several times uh, with President Obama. We heard he's done so with President Trump. We heard he did so with uh, Secretary Tillerson. Why? Uh, you'd have to ask him. But of course, let's uh, remember that uh, this gentleman, Reza Zarab, was implicated in this huge corruption case that erupted in November uh, uh, 23, December, sorry, 2013. And um, the president and his family were linked to some of the allegations of corruption, but uh, these were all quashed in Turkish courts and uh, Reza Zarab, who had been arrested in connection with that case, uh, was freed but then got arrested in this country. Okay, thank you. U.S.-Turkish relations in the new era. Gudun? Well, I think... Um much will the uh, two uh, bones of contention in Turkey US relations. First one is, as Zambi mentioned, the, the PYD US connection. Um, and the second one is, of course, the extradition of Fethullah Gulen. Um, so when Trump was elected, uh, Turkey was uh, the Turkish pro government media. 
uh, was quite happy thinking that now this would be a reset in Turkey-U.S. relations but because with the, uh, under the Obama administration, he was, he, Obama wanted to work with the PYD. It was obvious and uh, that they would not intervene in the, the, the legal process um, uh, that's involved in the extradition process. So they were hopeful that, that things would be different. But, uh, but I doubt it, and, uh, and I think that's, um, that's what lies at the heart of um, what Turkey-U.S. relations will look like moving forward. So the first question is, what's going to happen to U.S. PYD cooperation, and how will that uh, affect Turkey-U.S. relations? Again, I think it depends on how Turkey decides to deal with the Kurdish question. I mean, if, if Erdogan decides to move forward with the Kurdish peace process, um, I think he might pursue a more pragmatic approach vis-a-vis -vis the PYD in Syria. And that could certainly help uh, Turkey-US relations. But on the other, on uh, the extradition of Fethullah Gülen, I think it's, it's extremely difficult. I mean, Turkey has been trying to make this case, uh, trying to link Fethullah Gülen uh, personally to the coup attempt on July 15th. Uh, and sending boxes of documents, and yet, uh, it's first, it's a legal process. So the, the the U.S. court has to to decide, and that will take years. Um, uh, so I think it will remain uh, a problem in Turkey-U.S. relations. Okay, thank you, Sonia. So of course, I'm surrounded by two of the <coughs> smartest people in town, so I don't have much to add. Um, but before I do that. Um, I realized that uh, when I was dedicating my book uh, and discuss and to my mother, I think I may have been over, overly emotional because I was scanning the room at the same time to see uh, who's in, in here that who, to whom I owe gratitude for their help with the book. So over the years, I have had the, the uh, uh, you know privilege of working with an amazing group of research assistants, uh, including Oya and others in the room uh, who have helped me with the book, and I've stayed with, in touch with all of them. I bring them uh, fruits and yogurt in the morning. Um, and so when I need a favor, I can go and ask them. So I, uh, my former assistant, Tyler, is in this room. Tyler, thank you so much. Tyler helped me write my previous book, as well as uh, drafting some of the chapters for this. So uh, grateful. I'm also grateful to uh, two other people in the room. I'm, uh, those of you who know me know that I, in addition to, one of the things I, like mo I like more than writing, I guess, is teaching. Um, well, that's not true. I like yoga more, but that's OK. <laughs> so uh, I've, over the years, acquired a large group of uh, students at the State Department, Rob mentioned, at FSI and other places, and two of my former students, now uh, great friends are in the room, they both review the book. Uh, Rich Altson is here, thank you Rich, and Yuri Kim is here, thank you Yuri, I appreciate it. And uh, my thanks go to a whole bunch of other people that are all in the acknowledgements, and I'm grateful to all of you. But I want to turn to your question on, on U.S.-Turkish relations. I think that this is now a subset, Turkish foreign policy, especially regarding West, is a subset of Erdogan's domestic political agenda. Um, we talk about polarization. I was not able to kind of go into the depths of it, uh, why that is linked to foreign policy. He's kind of gone after various groups, demonizing them, uh, brutalizing them physically, cracking down on their rallies, locking them up, shutting them up in, in, uh, in the media. And that list uh, started in the last decade, a story I look at in my book, in the Ergenekon trial years, with the secularists and the military. He added to that list leftists and liberals, during the Gezi Park rallies of 2013 and Alevis. Then the uh, Kurds were added to the list and it went on and on. So if you add these groups demonized by Erdogan, uh, physically brutalized by the police, locked up in jail, uh, cracked down in the media, they make up now half of Turkey. That's what we saw on Sunday. So he cannot continue to demonize further groups and flip um, unless uh, he wants to flip a majority country against him, which is why I think he's policy of going after internal enemies has kind of ran its course. Now he, has a, he needs a policy of external enemies, and this is where I think I agree with Amberin. He's going to instrumentalize foreign policy even further. Uh, there's little domestic cost of bashing f Netherlands or Germany uh, or Europe, uh, but there's some benefit of uh, getting nationalists, especially MHP voters, to support his party. And I think we're going to see the same uh, regarding the Kurdish issue, U.S. cooperation with YPG, uh, and the Kurdish peace process as well. I think he's going to be unfriendly on all these three accounts, uh, which also will harm his relationship with the United States, uh, because at this stage it's almost a given that uh, Washington is going to move to take Raqqa with uh, YPG support, including SDF, but mainly with YPG support, and things might change. If Turkey delivers uh, to the table magically 12,000 well-trained, reliable troops who can take Raqqa, 
I think Washington would love to do Raqqa with Turkey. But if that's not happening in the next year, uh, it's going to be increasingly unlikely, which I think puts U.S. and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Turkey on a collision course. I also want to second Umberin's uh, comment on the election uh, outcome. Uh, Turkey has had, uh, and this is not something I foresaw when I wrote the book, uh, the idea that Erdogan's democratic mandate would one day be questioned. Uh, uh, he has won elections free and fair until this time. Uh, so the issue was not that I ever questioned that, but I think something that came out with the book is that the elections that took place on Sunday uh, were not only not fair, uh, but increasingly the signs of irregularities throw into doubt whether these elections were free and fair. And if that was not the case, that would be a shame. Turkey has had free and fair elections longer than uh, has had Spain. In, Turkey started doing this in 1950, would be the first time that would have happened. That would be an incredibly unfortunate development. So I hope that U.S. policy uh, puts Turkey on the mark for that going forward. Uh, Turkey is not a country that is used to having unfair elections that will kind of grudgingly give our seal of approval to yet one more unfair election. This is the first time it will be happening. And if elections go unfair and unfree, they don't go back free and fair. That does not happen. I have not seen historians in the room, political scientists, please help me. If you know cases where elections become unfair and free, and then they pivot back, so uh, I think this is a crucial time in that uh, in that sense also. Okay, very good. Thank you all very much. Um, let me turn to uh, to all the uh, uh, Turkish wisdom in the room, and those who lack some Turkish wisdom can can help get some from our panel. Uh, uh, questions uh, from the audience? Um, yes, here. If you could uh, um, wait and please identify yourself to our microphone. Thank you very much. My name is Albert Nikemkin. I just have a small question. I notice on the map that the voter uh, total number of votes is less, fewer than 24 million, but Turkey's population is over 70 million. That suggests a low voter participation rate. Does I, I think that's a mistake. Uh, no, no, that's, <laughs> that's an error. That's, that's from Anatolian agency's website, so it must be their error. Uh, their, Turkey's population is 80 million people. Turkey has 58 million registered voters. 50 million of them voted. There were 1 million um, count ballots that were uh, not validated. So there are 48 million and a half ballots that are valid and counted. Thank you. And Erdogan got uh, about 1.7 million uh, more ballots than the opposing side. The opposition has called into question 37% of the ballots to be recounted. Um, Erdogan has said, game over. I've become president. Thank you very much. OK, on the far right, uh, Ehud Yari. Speaking about foreign policy, how do you see relationship between the supreme leader in Ankara and the supreme leader in Tehran? There is some emerging rivalry and competition, it seems to me. Thank you. Turkish Iran. Well, there, there's always been uh, competition for centuries between Turkey and Iran, and they managed to compartmentalize their relationship, um, I think. and and. Um, I mean, they were on, on the opposing fronts in, in Syria, and yet they kept signing uh, trade deals and worked together. So they've been pursuing a very pragmatic approach, and I don't expect that to change, because the two countries, especially Turkey, needs um, Iran. It, uh, it's uh, dependent on, on Iranian energy. Uh, so I don't think, uh, no matter how... No, I mean, the, the, the disagreements in, in Syria obviously will prevail, um, but, but I don't think that they will, uh, it will come to a breaking point in, uh, in Turkey-Iran relations. We d though, that said, and I agree completely with uh, Gönül that Turkey has been very effective even before Erdogan in compartmentalizing that relationship, which is a very complex one, uh, but increasingly you hear uh, a much more Sunni sectarian tone in Erdogan's rhetoric, which uh, is causing, um, I think, quite a bit of annoyance, shall I say, in Tehran, which has been expressed. And I think uh, the, the, you know, a lot will be uh, determined by the position the Trump administration takes on Iran, whether it decides to be much more aggressive than the Obama administration and whether Turkey perceives that as a way of um, redefining, um, resetting its relationship with the United States by siding with it. Uh, so Ehud asked about uh, relations with the supreme leader in, uh, in Tehran. Let me ask about the uh, supreme leader in Jerusalem. Um, uh, 
there's been this pragmatic um, trade relationship that has been sustained even while the politics has been rather uh, rather sour between uh, Ankara and Jerusalem. How do you think uh, this relationship will evolve um, in the new era? Sonar? Of course, uh, happy take on that. Um, I think that it's also another compartmentalized relationship where the economic part of it is going to grow. Um, that is driven by necessity. Um, Turkey's uh, uh, is a growing economy. It's uh, of all the G20 economies, uh, with the exception of Korea, it's the only one that has no nuclear, no natural gas, and no oil. So it's completely dependent on energy expo imports uh, for its growth. And yet uh, it gets three quarters of its gas and oil from Russia and Iran, two of its adversaries in the region. Uh, everywhere, the Russians are undermining him. And I think that uh, while there's compartmentalization, Iranians are actually uh, not very happy, uh, extremely unhappy with Turkish policy in Syria. Uh, there's some analysts who are suggesting some Iranian PKK axis and uh, Sinjar and what have you. Uh, so th that's, a, that's definitely a warning sign for Erdogan going forward. But what that compartmentalization with Iran also means, uh, and what that rivalry with Iran within the background of compartmentalization means that he doesn't want to buy as much gas and oil from them going forward as he wants to buy less Russian gas and oil going forward. And uh, guess what? Which means he's going to buy Kurdish uh, oil from Kurdistan and Israeli gas. And I think that's his ultimate goal. Uh, and Israeli size, of course, has an interest in there. Um, they have a lot of gas to sell. Turkey is the, most, uh, the closest large market that can absorb Israeli gas, has the money to pay for it, and the political will to do such a deal. So I think th th there's some prospects of that moving forward. But politically, of course, their relationship is always going to be undermined by continued Turkish links with Hamas. Uh, uh, and uh, so I would say it depends on the, uh, to what extent the Israelis are able to tolerate uh, a strong economic relationship with Turkey, uh, which from which they also benefit, and Turkish ties to Hamas, and the, whether this will be a breaking point or not again going forward. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, please. In the center? Yep. Uh, you seem to be sitting could, in descending. Could you just identify yourself? Please? Uh, sure, Amanda Sloat. Thank you. Uh, you seem to be sitting in, in descending orders of, of optimism, with with Ganold declaring herself <laughs> outright optimistic. Uh, Soner, you know, saying this may be the best of, of a bad scenario, and and Umbrin sounding a little more pessimistic. Uh, so for all three of you, but especially for for the first two of you, I'm I'm curious what you see as the basis for optimism, given that you've got. Consolidated power now in the presidency. You've got a very fractured and weak opposition. You've got a significant crackdown on journalists and, and civil society. What are going to be the remaining levers within the country that are going to enable people to continue to, to fight back against uh, some of these greater authoritarian moves? Well, electoral politics. Uh, I mean, there is, as uh, Amberin mentioned, so this. What we saw on Sunday, the results are the, the uh, institutional changes will not kick in until 2019. And there are still elections, yes, increasingly unfair, um, non-free, but, but there are still elections, and ele elections still do matter. So I think that's why we've seen, I don't know if you were following uh, Twitter on the day of the referendum, but I remember seeing the pictures of, uh, of Erdogan and his close advisors looking uh, qu quite um, sad. Uh, so I think that they have taken note of, of how much um, ground Erdogan and the AKP has lost in its stronghold, uh, like Istanbul. So I think uh, this will require a recalibration of strategy, and also they will have to, the status quo is not sustainable. I mean, especially with, and we've been saying this, economic, uh, I mean, the, the, the economic growth, um, success was achieved under Erdogan's rule, and that's, I think, the most important reason for the support that he's been receiving. And uh, in the absence of that, uh, that coalition, uh, loose coalition that, that, that he has will fracture. So he has to make sure that, that he carries out uh, structural reforms. He has to make sure that, that you don't have bombs exploding in major cities. Uh, further instability and chaos is going to hurt him electorally. So that's why I think he has to change course. And, and we've seen that before uh, because he's, he's, he's very pragmatic. So, so my short answer is electoral politics is, is, is the reason why I'm uh, slightly optimistic than the rest of the panel. And so in order of optimism and height, um, I'm going forward. Um, 
Yes, uh, I agree with electoral politics. Great uh, uh, point. I'll add to it. I had decided not to give you any more snippets from my book because I wanted you to buy it, but I'll give you one more. Um, so I argue in my book that the time in Turkey for Ataturk model has passed. Uh, one of the reasons is that it has passed anywhere else. You can't shape societies like that anymore. That was unique to Ataturk's time. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. That's why Erdogan has to give up on it. It's not because I like or dislike what he's doing. It will not work. You cannot shape a society top down in your own image as a leader, especially if that society is 97% literate. That's Turkey's literacy rate. It will become universally literate by the end of the decade. Literacy is increasing a percent point a year. and become the first large Muslim majority society in earth history ever to attain universal literacy. So in a society which is completely literate, which is 80% urban, which is largely middle class, it's going to be so hard for this guy to shape the whole country in his own image. Not sustainable. He can try, but it won't work. Uh, half of the country will not fold under him. Uh, hopefully it will be democratic, and it is democratic, uh, that they'll oppose him, and I think that will balance it out. And I think uh, my uh, sense of optimism is that uh, Despite the fact that Erdogan controls a large part of the media, people say 90% is probably more than that, that there's complete a media blackout on pro anti Erdogan option in the referendum. Resources devoted to the pro Erdogan yes campaign far outweighed resources devoted to the no Erdogan option. Uh, he only got 51%, despite, despite all that, if that. Maybe not even that. So that kind of tells me that you have to have faith in Turkey. Uh, it's a great country. You have millions and millions of people who, without, without, because despite the fact that information and their access to equal campaigning was limited, still came out and voted in large numbers. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, uh, of course, a, a ground for optimism. So I'm actually betting on Turkey's diversity, uh, the fact that it's economically too big, uh, demographically too large, and politically too complicated one, for one person to shape it in their own image. And I think that time has really passed. I'd like to send, I'd like to think that uh, the Ataturk model that Erdogan is emulating, uh, where he's trying to both repeat Ataturk's uh, methods but also get rid of his legacy, is therefore uh, not sustainable. And I have uh, a lot of faith in electoral uh, politics going forward. The question is whether you have a center-right option that comes out to challenge Erdogan, because you know Turkey is mainly a, 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 a right-wing country. In any election year, uh, right-wing parties do about 60% of the vote, sometimes up to two-thirds. Left-wing parties do... 30% up to one-third of the vote. So it's hard for me to see a single left-wing party uh, seat, uh, getting him out. Uh, I think it will have to come, the challenge from the center-right. Uh, and in this regard, I think what will really happen is what happens to MHP, this nationalist faction that we talked about earlier that I think is splitting. Is the map there? Yeah. So the MHP's voter ba base is basically uh, in two parts of Turkey. One is in central and northeastern Turkey, which is conservative and rural. And one is coastal and urban Turkey. In uh, n northeast and central Turkey, the party's electorate completely, uh, or maybe for the most part, folded under Erdogan. But its voters in the coastal provinces and the big cities have voted against him, meaning they have also abandoned MHP. Where are they going to go next? That's an important constituency. Could this be the future of Turkey's center-right movement? Could the right leadership uh, take over that power and AKP itself, although it is led by Erdogan, who comes from an Islamist pedigree, it is not an Islamist party par excellence. It has many center-right figures in it. Its voters are overwhelmingly center-right and conservative. And the question is whether you have a center-right option that could bring together center-right voters outside of AKP and inside AKP to challenge them. So I think there is a trajectory uh, for Turkey going forward. And uh, that's my fourth book, The Case for Liberal Turkey, which I'm going to write. So. Do you want to come in on this? Okay, very good. Rafi in front. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rafi Danziger, consultant to APAC. So first of all, Sonera, congratulations. Thank you very much. I will buy the book, definitely, and will read it. Number two, uh, Rob robbed me of my main question. Uh, I was going to ask about Israel, so I'll ask my backup question. <laughs> and that is that uh, Turkey is now negotiating with Russia on buying the S-400. And I was wondering if this is just a tactic to get better terms from a NATO system. What do you think? They really mean it, and they really will buy a Russian system for their air defenses. Thank you. And you can put this in, a, in even in a more general context about where you think the future of Turkish-NATO relations are going to go in, uh, in this new era. 
Well, I think it's hard to answer that question without knowing what the, where the, what the future of NATO itself is. Uh, but setting that aside, uh, these negotiations with, with Russia on the S-400, I do think there's a fair bit of posturing involved and that Turkey is keeping its options open. And in case it felt that the United States was align, aligning more fully with its own interests in, in Syria in particular, uh, that we wouldn't be hearing so much about the S-400s anymore. But uh, just looking at the situation on the ground in Syria and Russian behavior, uh, you know, despite this alleged love fest between Erdogan and Putin after Erdogan uh, pretty much apologized to him, what you're seeing on the ground is Russia really acting against Turkish interests. When Turkey tried to make a move on Mambij, Russia sent its f forces together with regime forces. Uh, some people say that the YP just swapped uniforms. I don't know what exactly happened, but in any case, Russia moving to protect them, doing the same on the western flank with Afrin, um, and really hemming Turkey in on both sides, and, and you know, not allowing Turkey really to um, act the way it, li it would like to inside Syria, and, and also seeming very ready to sort of go after Turkey the minute that Turkey shows any sign of, of again shifting back to regime change, especially when we saw, uh, you know, the enthusiasm displayed by Erdogan uh, when the mi cruise missiles hit Sheikh Khan, Sheikh Hun, and you know, the Russian response to that. And then we have this whole business of what happens with Jabhat al-Nusra, whatever you'd like to call it. I can't remember its latest name. Uh, but obviously lots of pressure on Turkey to move against Jabhat al-Nusra, and it's a position to do so because Idlib is right there on the Turkish border. And I think there's also a lot of tension even on the trade front. Uh, there were bans on uh, veg vegetable exports, for instance. Some of them, they haven't been removed yet. And uh, Turkey was eagerly expecting Russian tourists to, to go back to Turkey. And, and I think just a few weeks ago, uh, the charter flights, Russia decided to cancel them. So even uh, there, there is tension on that front. So that just indicates that uh, contrary to what we've been seeing in the pro-government media, uh, it's uh, neither side trust uh, each other. I mean, Putin doesn't really trust Erdogan. I'm not sure about Erdogan because he was quite optimistic. He thought that if that he could change uh, the Russian calculations in Syria, which obviously he couldn't. Uh, but but I don't think it's uh, it's as smooth as um, projected by by the, by the government circles in Turkey. Also, quickly on Russia, I think uh, if Erdogan thinks that he has a friend in Moscow, he's, uh, he's wrong, um, um, and a big mistake. Uh, I think the way Putin looks at the region and the Middle East, um, his main concern, uh, among, of course, uh, Syrian war and everything else going on, is the success of political Islam, specifically success of Sunni political Islam, which is one reason why I think he's extremely friendly with Egypt. Uh, uh, not as clear, but his stance in Libya uh, Putin is preferring or uh, actually picking uh, secular politics and, po and entities and governments, it doesn't matter what their nature is, over uh, the, the brotherhood slash political Islam alternative. And for him, uh, Erdogan's success in Turkey is the success of political Islam in uh, Russia's uh, near abroad in the northern tier of the Middle East. Unacceptable. He'll do everything he can to undermine him. Uh, he'll support his opposition, uh, which is why he has linked with uh, both YPG and uh, people say, PKK and he'll have stronger ties with them going forward because that's a chip uh, for Putin against Erdogan in Turkey and outside, which is also why he's in Afrin, as Amberin mentioned. There's no reason for the Russians or anybody else to be in Afrin. Afrin YPG enclave is surrounded by not ISIS. You're not fighting ISIS there. It's surrounded by Assad regime in Turkey. If you're there, if you're with the Assad regime, it means you're fighting Turkey in the long term. And I think that's a clear positioning. Uh, so I think he sees uh, Erdogan's uh, f uh, fall as his ultimate goal, and that's why I think that Erdogan would be mistaken to think that uh, Putin is a friend uh, going forward. There's another reason for, I think, why he's adversarial to the success of Erdogan's experiment in Turkey. Russia is about 20% Muslim. Its Muslim community uh, has either historic or ethnic ties to Turkey. Uh, Tatars, who constitute majority of Russian Muslims, are closely linked to Turks. 
and uh, Circassians and Chechens are historically linked to Turks because they were expelled by the Tsars uh, and they have a large diaspora in Turkey. So uh, Putin, of course, knows that any, any, th what happens in Turkey resonates stronger, strongly, in, much, much stronger inside Russia than what happens in Egypt or Libya. And that's why I think the ultimate fall of Erdogan's model is his goal, and I just don't see how they can be friends going uh, forward. And I think Russia is going to be his main adversary uh, as the polarization continues. And the, and the scenarios that I looked at in my book include, of course, how Russians are and have tried, of course, to undermine Turkey's uh, stability uh, going forward. Interesting. Very good. Uh, Ambassador Ginsburg on my right. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Sona, and, and very Thank much so enjoy much. the panel. Uh, there's something that you didn't mention, or at least I didn't pick up from any of you, and maybe that's because you consider the issue not relevant to the outcome of the referendum, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to help me get better educated. And that is what happened in the coup, or the quarter coup, the third coup, the thir whatever you may want to call it, whatever happened as a result of the Golanists, did, what has been the impact, since that was all we were reading about when Turkey was the post-coup roundup, what has the coup's consequences been on this referendum and the situation in Turkey going forward? Because it, it almost sounds like you're s the two issues almost are separate since none of you brought the coup into your discussions as to where things are going today. Well, well, I think um, the, the failed coup almost handed him the victory that he captured on, on Sunday. So I'm sorry if <laughs> we forgot to mention that. But, uh, but I think it played a huge role because once again, um, that victimhood narrative that, that Sonar uh, talks about in his book, and once again, that was at play. Because, b because of that failed coup, he could be able to um, recreate that narrative. And now he's the victim of, of uh, enemies out, not just out there, but also b within the state. So I think that that played, that played a very important role. Um, in terms of um, the, the Gulen supporters, um, I remember in the run-up to the referendum, um, listening to uh, um, to scholars in Turkey who were talking about um, whether this he he alienated um, the thousands of people uh, after um, after the failed coup and people were asking whether that would translate into uh, loss of vote uh, f on on Sunday I I I don't think I can answer that question but but clearly. Um, they d the question comes down to how much electoral support did the Gulenists have? Um, I mean, were they a real political bloc? Uh, because what we hear is that, that whole debate that is going on that is very critical of the government and the purges uh, themselves, they're mostly within the elite of, of, of the Gulen movement. And, and many of them, uh, those who are not in jail, they managed to flee the country. And the rest, uh, they just do not see the difference. Uh, they share the same base, uh, the similar ideologies. So that's why uh, the, the purges, they did not translate into uh, uh, into uh, loss of votes for, for Erdogan on, on Sunday. Anything else on the impact of the coup? Um, <laughs> I don't think any of us really knows what happened, in fact, that the night of the coup. Who actually participated, who actually planned it, I still think that remains a big mystery. I mean, you know, the narrative is that uh, a significant number of Gulenists were involved and that this was a coalition uh, between them and various other anti-Erdogan uh, officers uh, in the army. But I don't think we know because the government has seen to it that we don't know. Uh, the parliamentary inquiry that was supposed to be conducted on this has, has been very opaque. Uh, and, of course, you know, the media has been muzzled and is unable to do its job. Uh, so I think we really don't know what's going on inside the army itself as a result of this coup. And I think that is the more important question. What impact has this coup had on the army? And what does this portend for its... Our future in terms of a well, 
the ability to intervene again, if it so chooses to, uh, and what its role will be overall in, in um, Turkish political life, but perhaps most importantly of, uh, of all, who the army is, who, who, what, what kind of people are joining the, the army, what's the new ideology in the army. And there are suggestions out there that it's very different to the Kemalist um, army of yore, that it's much more conservative, religious, uh, the new inductees are much more in the mold of Erdogan's vision as described by Sonar, but this is just speculation for now. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Khalid Fattah. I have a couple quick questions. Uh, we heard about uh, resuming peace process. Uh, after what happened in uh, Jazeera and Sharnak and all this area, do you think there is a, an opportunity for resuming peace process uh, with the HDP? Um, my other question is, um, um, of course, uh, AKP was shortened in a couple or about 30 votes to uh, to get approved for the uh, 18 uh, article to be uh, changed or the change of the constitution and got support from uh, Mahaba, MHP. Um, uh, what's kind of deal between uh, AKP Islamic route and the Kamalist uh, to get to that deal and pass the draft of the constitution? Um, uh, also, on this map, is showing that. Uh, why, don't, why don't we just take two questions? All right. All right. All right. So, uh, um, uh, for non-Turkish aficionados, this was uh, the peace process between the government and the Kurds in the south, and between, and then the second question on the relationship between the Islamist AKP and the hard, uh, hard nationalist secularist um, uh, uh, MHP. What deal was struck? I can take the second one. Uh, yeah, or you want it? Well, um, since I'm the contrarian here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's your turf. <laughs> on the Kurdish issue. <laughs> um, first of all, we need to be very clear about which Kurds do we think that President Erdogan would be talking to if indeed he feels, you know, this new magnanimity or or is just compelled to, as, as uh, Gunnar said, because he has no other choice. Uh, the fact that he's you know, already talking about the death penalty, the fact that he's lashing out against the YPG, uh, you know, um, just within hours practically of the uh, result being announced, I don't think doesn't, I, I don't think that suggests that he's uh, ready anytime soon to resume peace talks with the Öcalan inspired political, Kurdish political movement is how I sort of roughly define it, which in turn I think is bad news for people like Selatin Demirtas, especially between now and the time that this uh, presidential system fully kicks in and he has new parliamentary elections uh, where he hopes to drive the HDP and the MHT, uh, MHP below the 10% threshold. Uh, so that, you know, he'll have an absolute majority in parliament and the CHP will end up looking pretty much like um, I guess the opposition does in Russia. Uh, I, I don't think that he's ready to talk to them at all. On the contrary, as I was saying at a panel that uh, Gönül very kindly hosted the other day, I think he's creating his own Kurdish uh, nomenclatura. This will be a mix of pious um, Kurds. Uh, we already saw that Hudapar uh, voted for him in this election, and that might explain a part of the bump though some would argue that irregularities and the fact that the Kurds were, you know, uh, prevented from campaigning effectively and monitoring effectively explains that as well. Um, he will create, I think, by awarding contracts, tenders in all these cities, towns that were destroyed, he will, you know, through patronage, create some kind of a base for himself among the Kurds, but I don't think he's going to go back to talking to either the PKK uh, or the HDP unless Öcalan completely rolls over and agrees to do everything he tells him to do, which again I don't think is very likely because if he were to do so, he'd lose all credibility with the Kurdish people or his own followers among the Kurdish people. So unlikely to see uh, um, a reconciliation there. 
Sonia? Well, I just oh, want to add, add one thing, though. When he talks about death penalty, I think he's, he's referring to the Gulenists because you can't really apply retroactively, right? So you think he cares when he's talking about severing ties with Europe and tells the OSCE to, you know, mind their own business and, uh, you know... Uh, well, that's not my point, though. My he point can do is what he if wants. If, if you read, um, I mean, if you think that just because he talked about death penalty, he cannot possibly be talking about returning to the Kurdish peace process. What I'm saying is that that could not, maybe that's not relevant because maybe he's not referring to Abdullah Öcalan and instead he's referring to the Gülenists uh, when, he, when he talks about death penalty. Um, and yeah, I mean, I made my point. I, I'm, uh, I'm more optimistic, and especially if you look at, I mean, the HDP has, has lost ground too. So I think the Kurds, they don't have many options to turn to. I mean, if you look at places like Hakkari, it's a, it's a border town, it's, a, um, it's uh, an HDP stronghold, and in fact, in Hakkari, HDP has, has been the only party there. And places like Shirnak, for instance, I mean, the fact that in such a context where Erdogan uh, has been referring to this, using this ultra-nationalist rhetoric, if he could be able to capture votes in those towns at the expense of the HDP, uh, that tells me that, that the Kurds also, uh, they think that he is the only uh, uh, person who can broker a peace deal. So if there's such demand, and as long as there's electoral politics, um, I, I, I think he might end up uh, going back and... Um, but, but that's presuming that that election was free and fair in the southeast. No, it wasn't free and fair. That's what I'm saying. And I also, I think comparing the results of a, re a referendum where there's a clear yes or no with those of, you know, parliamentary elections where, let's say, the Hudapa voter would be voting for Hudapa, not AK Party, but in this case says yes. You know, it's kind of apples and oranges, and we, I think we need to be very careful and need much more information of what actually happened before we draw, uh, I think, firm conclusions about voting patterns among the Kurds in the southeast. No, you're okay. Well, I can also add, uh, chime in. Um, it's a great discussion. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think what happened in the Kurdish area is a little bit of a mystery. Um, uh, so overall, uh, Turks love to vote, right? We know that. 85% um, turnout. Um, turnout was much higher in areas where the referendum failed. It reached 90%. Uh, all over the coastal provinces, wherever it failed, it's at 90. That's pretty impressive for any democracy, right? Um, turnout was lower in Kurdish areas than the national average. It was about 80, and in some provinces, up higher, upper 70s. So lower turnout in Kurdish areas, but it's the only area where Erdogan's uh, vote for Erdogan made significant gains compared to vote for AKP in the elections before. And that's... And the votes for Hudapar, I think, is part of the bump, but they don't explain uh, gains of 20% in some provinces. Overall, Erdogan's vote, um, you know, Erdogan's vote compared to AKP vote in the last elections, or vote for him in the presidential elections, if you compare uh, whichever one you take, mainly stagnated across the country and dropped in certain provinces. In Istanbul, it dropped a little bit. In Ankara, it dropped a little bit across the board. It increased in Kurdish areas, so... Uh, it's still a mystery. I think if there are any irregularities, they will be there. This is kind of my, my non-pollster view of looking, non-statistical view of looking at this as a secular observer of Turkish politics. And I'd love to see if there's anything really that really happened. Yeah. I would like to add, of course, that the PKK's uh, decision to carry the war to the cities, you know, caused a lot of... Um, unhappiness among ordinary Kurds. They were very, very upset that the PKK did that to them. So in that sense, if you'd had a free and fair election, I, I'm, I still think that you'd see the HDP vote go down. So, uh, you know, sh I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so let's, let's just take a couple more questions, then we're going to bring this to a close. Hillel and David, I'm sorry, we're, we're just going to run out of time on this. <coughs> Uh, hello, Fratkin. Uh, also, congratulations, Sonar, and uh, congratulations to the panel. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to Sonar's uh, scenarios uh, and also his remark about Erdogan's strategy. Uh, I think you said his strategy was to, or had the effect of creating about half the country as enemies, 
And when he, now that he's run out of domestic enemies, he has to uh, turn towards foreign enemies. But it also seems like he has nothing but foreign enemies. So I'm wondering how, how he handles a situation in which he has no friends, no external friends, uh, and what that would mean for your uh, three original or four original scenarios. Okay. Uh, Dave Pollack up in front. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, congratulations on a great book and a great panel. Um, I, I want to ask about, strangely enough, about Islam. We, we really haven't heard all that much from any of you about the specifically religious Islamic aspect of either Erdogan's program going forward, his appeal to voters, uh, what effect that has on foreign policy. Um, and I, I guess my conclusion from what you've been saying is that in, after 15 years in power, Erdogan and the AKP have not managed to further Islamize Turkish society and politics. Is that a correct conclusion? And um, what else can you say about what specific aspects of Islamic issues might come up in the future? Okay, so implications of having no friends, uh, Islam in Turkey, and then uh, lastly, just for the record, um, is this the last election Erdogan wins? Or do you expect him to win again? Um, when he comes up for uh, election uh, in 2019. We're going to just mark it in, in the history books. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can take the last question on Islam. I think he managed to Islamize society, um, but he hasn't really, he, he hasn't even tried to Islamize the state. So that's why, especially if you look at... Uh, I've always I argued that Turkish Islamism is somewhat different than, than the Middle Eastern, um, th than the Islamism in, in the region, in other parts of the region. And that's, again, I think that has something to do with that state tradition that I, I, I talked about. So I think when he came to power, um, he became part of that bureaucracy and he socialized into that state culture. So he didn't even try to Islamize the state institutions itself. So the Islamism literature in Turkey, for instance, it doesn't really uh, makes reference to uh, concepts like Sharia, for instance, that often. Uh, and that tells you something about the, the uh, Turkish Islamist psyche. Uh, so I think there is no threat there. That's why when we say that the, the problem is not um, Erdogan's Islamism, but the problem is his authoritarianism. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be a problem, but always, again, I mean, his, his whole project has, be, has, uh, has revolved around uh, raising pious generations and, and turning the Turkish society into a more religious society, and I think he has managed that. Uh, but of course, I think we need political scientists to, to do more research on this is a global phenomenon, I mean, the rise of religiosity. So maybe Turkey is not an exception in that regard. I, I don't know if it was Erdogan's doing, I mean, of course, to a certain extent, yes, because he changed, transformed the whole education system, transformed major uh, dynamics within society. But when it comes to uh, creating a Sharia type state. I don't think he has done much. Before he came to power, he was very critical of Kemalist institutions like Directorate for Religious Affairs, for instance, because he always argued that uh, Diyanet, as we call it in Turkish, Diyanet has always been a, a Kemalist tool to not only suppress uh, religion, but also control religion. Uh, and, and he promoted uh, uh, getting rid of that institution. But he came to power, and now it's even a bigger bureaucracy with a bigger budget. So I think that points to his statist instincts. So he became a bureaucrat in that regard. Um, I'd just like to add a few words. Um, I think he does instrumentalize Islam, though. And that can be quite dangerous, as we've seen it manifested in, for instance, videos that were posted of a police cadet's training where they <coughs> chant Islamist slogans, or the people they're training in Jarabalus who do the same. 
Um, and the fact that when the coup was unfolding, he rallied people around religion. You had the imams, you know, blaring Islamist slogans, calling, making a call for jihad, uh, essentially. So a lot of instrumentalization of Islam, you know, much more so than any of his predecessors, clearly. And the other thing that I would point to as a risk is uh, Salafism and the fact that groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, like ISIS, have established networks inside Turkey and seem to be, have at least, recruited with great ease. Uh, so that's something that obviously needs to be watched. Yes, I have the final word just before we conclude. Uh, of course, um, uh, I agree with Amber, and I think um, if Turkey's neighbors were Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Belgium, I would not be worried about Islamization. I would say Turkey has strong middle class, educated people, connected to the world. Has it been to Luxembourg, um, Belgium <laughs> recently? Okay. <laughs> or how about Canada and Spain? <laughs> That's not the case. ISIS is a neighbor, uh, um, and it has been a neighbor for a while now. I think it's the jihadists. Uh, next door that makes Turkey's Islamization dangerous for Turkey and Turks because that exp it means Turkey can become a recruiting pool for jihadist ideology and I, I there's a chapter in my book but I won't tell you more about it. <laughs> you, have to, you have to buy it. Um, uh, I want to take the other question on just before finishing on foreign enemies. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, b because the polarization politics doesn't won't help him win another round of elections there will be another election and he has to win that because otherwise he'll have to do what the French call cohabitation. He's going to be a president, and his parliament is going to from another party. And the system is not set up to function like that. It's set up to have a majority controlled by the president and the parliament. It will, it will, it will collapse. So he will have to have AKP solid majority in the next elections and to not end up in cohabitation. And to get there, he has to win elections. Whenever the elections are this year, early on time, 2019, uh, foreign enemies is only his only way going forward. So nationalism will drive his agenda. It's easy to unify. And I think that's where the earlier question about MHP and AKP agreement comes in. Yeah, they're very different parties, but AKP's uh, base and MHP's base in certain areas overlaps significantly in Turkey. Again, if you look at the map, the areas of central and um, northeastern Turkey where support for Erdogan was strong from MHP is where... Uh, MHP base is significantly more conservative than other areas, so that's why the deal uh, worked. And I think this is going to be his game going forward. He's going to consolidate a nationalist agenda uh, with his uh, strongman uh, image. So that means problems with Europe, uh, problems with the United States, and at least in the short term, uh, significant problems with the U.S. On, on the Kurdish account. Before I finish, I just wanted to take one final word. Um, uh, I was extremely delighted to see so many friends uh, and colleagues here today. Thank you all for coming. This is a a great afternoon for me. This is a labor of love of the last year. Thank you, Oya, again. You've been great with me and, and bearing with my crazy uh, uh, work hours. And uh, it's been a, a wonderful project. So I'm really happy to launch this book with you. And finally, before I conclude, of course, I want to thank uh, Tony and Vanessa Bayer. I'm a Bayer family fellow. Uh, their, work, their, their, their generosity makes uh, my work happen. I hope they're watching me. Hello. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I'll be out there if you want me to sign copies. Otherwise, uh, we'll do more events on the book. Um, I'm going to CNN from here, so you'll see me in an hour. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much, Gunul Emberin, and congratulations, Sonair. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. That was excellent. You're my favorite. I love you. I'm gonna take you out to dinner. With your support, for color.